Capote's a liar, and everyone knows he is. It really was a sort of intellectual friendship, though people inevitably thought otherwise. Now, I don't care what anybody says about me as long as it isn't true. I'm talking too intimately to you. <laughs> Let's get on to something more general. <laughs> Hello, Zachary and Jim. Thanks for joining but, Attitude for a chat today. Many people will know Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams for their most popular works. Capote for Breakfast at Tiffany's and In Cold Blood and Williams for A Streetcar Named Desire and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. But they both made a huge impact on popular culture. Um, Jim, if we start with you first, when did you first become aware of Capote and how would you describe him to somebody new to his work and to his life? Oh, gosh. I first became aware of Capote when I was a young teenager and was going through heralded films and um, that I was reading about. And, and I watched the movie of In Cold Blood. I had not read Capote by that time. Um, and I didn't learn a lot more about him until I watched Philip Seymour Hoffman play him in, in the movie version. And I learned as much as I know about Capote from being a part of this film as I have from anything else. And so my somewhat ignorant description of Capote to anybody who doesn't already know him would be he was a magnificently poetic, passionate writer, but he also was, some consider him the inventor of like journalistic fiction, that kind of true crime story with In Cold Blood. He was extremely intelligent I would call him mercurial. I think that um, he was uh, good at a, at a biting phrase, even towards those he loved, as you can see in this film. He was one of those people, they say, they broke the mold when they made Truman Capote. He's, he's utterly unique as an individual. Zachary, what struck you most when you were first exposed to Tennessee Williams' work? I became familiar with Tennessee Williams uh, in high school. The film, uh, the John Malkovich version of The Glass Menagerie and A Streetcar Named Desire, uh, the film version of uh, A Cat on a Hudson Roof. There was a bombastic nature to Tennessee as a writer that I always felt really at once charmed by and challenged by at the same time. And, uh, and then in 2013, I did a production of The Glass Menagerie, um, first in, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts at uh, the American Repertory Theater and then on Broadway uh, the following year. And, uh, and, and that was really my, my deep immersion into Tennessee, not only as a writer, as a playwright, but also as a person and reading as much as I did about who he was and his life and the complexity of it was something that uh, generated in me an incredibly deep respect and affinity and um, identification with him um, to a certain extent. Um, so I, I really, when, when Lisa reached out and uh, invited me to be a part of this documentary, aside from being a fan of her other work, I was really drawn to the idea of examining the relationship between these two iconic and, and, and influential voices of American literature. I think the film makes an ex extraordinarily good job of exploring that relationship. Um, Jim, they, they had a lot in common, these, these two men. They're both gay, they're both from the South, both famous writers who worked the sort of chat show circuit, very much celebrities of their time, also both addicts. Um, how would you characterize the differences between them? Oh, boy. I, I do think that, and this sort of came up, Zach and I were talking in, a, in another interview about it, so I hadn't thought of this until recently, but one of the things I noted working on it, and as we've talked about it, is that there was a certain, I think that, I think Capote was more defensive in many ways. I think Capote was, came off as, to me, more afraid of being hurt than than Tennessee did. Tennessee seems to me a little more willing to put it all out there in a less guarded way. And I think you can even see this in their physicalities and in the way that they talk. Um, there's a there's a guardedness, in my opinion, to Truman, a, a back-footedness of like, I'm going to stay back here and, and wait and see what happens. And I feel like Tennessee, and I think his work speaks to this too, there's a, a passionate outpouring 
and I'm sure he was also afraid of getting hurt in his own way and was, but um, he didn't, he either chose not to or didn't know how to be as defensive about it and, and guarded. Zachary, they had a friendly but sometimes fractious friendship. It was almost like frenemies at points. Um, Williams says in, in the documentary, Truman wanted more than any of us to be famous. And Capote admitted that jealousy was the key to his character. He also said that Williams was a genius, but what genius, but wasn't very intelligent, which I found very, very funny. Um, was this rivalry a sign of their time when there were so few or far fewer sort of out gay men in the public eye that there was almost a sort of rivalry that was innate in that situation? Yeah, I mean, I do think that Tennessee and Truman uh, were were very similar in in the ways of um, reckoning with their own self loathing. And one of the byproducts of reckoning um, with that that deep level of societal pressure and uh, <clears throat> judgment and and what that creates in 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 the psyche of a person, I think, is to direct it to people in whom that same um, experience can be so easily seen. That was a very convoluted way to say it, but but you know, like they saw themselves in one another, and and I think as a result of that, um, they didn't always like what they saw, and so there was um, there was a sharpness to the way that they related, but at the same time, they deeply respected one another. Um, they fueled one another, they inspired one another, and uh, and I think they loved one another on some levels, but I just think um, they didn't love themselves enough to necessarily know how to manifest that outwardly. You mentioned the Glass Menagerie already. It's obviously Tennessee's most obviously overtly autobiographical play, but there were elements of him in all of his work, and he says that he was both Stanley and Blanche in Streetcar. Mm. Um, Blanche's famous line about relying on the kindness of strangers is one that many gay men of the time, I'm sure, could relate to. Do you think that, do you think that still holds true today? Sure, absolutely. There, almost more so today, in the sense that you know, I, I don't think it's uh, exclusive to gay men or LGBTQ plus people. I think we live in a time now when technology and social media have created these portals through which we see others living their lives and we compare ourselves to them and we we look outside of ourselves in so many ways that are now more reinforced by our culture um, and by our societies so whether you're relying on the kindness of strangers or um you know the immediate gratification of how many people like your photo that you just put up on your social media platform it's 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 almost more difficult to find a sense of fulfillment from within now. We're kind of more conditioned, I think, culturally to look outside of ourselves for that. Um, yeah, so I definitely feel like there was a, a brutality to, to Tennessee's experience. He, he wasn't afraid of the extremes within himself. And, uh, and he put those into all of his characters. Yeah, Stanley and Blanche and Maggie the Cat and Brick and you know, all the people that uh, there, there, there's a lot of speculation as to brick sexuality and cat on a hot tin roof and, you know, and, and Maggie's kind of uh, hothouse flower persona, you know, the, those are all qualities that Tennessee embodied in, in different times and in different places and in different ways. So I do think we see a lot of that in his work. Capote enjoyed fame and sort of embraced celebrity, whereas Tennessee always seemed to be a bit more hesitant and take less pleasure from it. What are your feelings, both of you, about fame? And is there an added pressure to be a good gay role model when you're an out gay person in the public eye? Do you feel your life is compromised by that in any way? I don't feel compromised by it, but I think anybody, and not even just uh, LGBTQ plus people, it, it's, you know, I think everybody right now who has any sort of platform for any reason at all feels a certain obligation, you know, and many times I'll be blunt about it, it's fear, you know, to wonder, I, I'm just trying to speak honestly, am I saying something wrong that's going to cause me big issues, you know, it, it's, it, yeah. Um, and in that way, I don't, that, to me, that can be 
uh, a worrying aspect of being somebody who's known by other people. That being said, at a very personal level, it's the kind of thing that's allowed me to do uh, both in my career and in my life, have experiences that I would have never had otherwise. And so, you know, it's, it's, I would never complain about it. Well, in the privacy of my own home, of course I would, <laughs> not on an interview with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I feel um, this this whole last year has taught me, uh, among other things, how much I have to learn and how sometimes the best tool of learning can be um, not necessarily silence, because I think I've always been someone who will acknowledge things if I feel like I need to acknowledge them. I'll step up to something if I feel I need to step up to it um, socially or personally or politically. But there's a there's a lot of shifts happening in our culture right now that I think deserve um, space and uh, and consideration. And um, so I've I've been interested in in looking at that and um, having a relationship to that and 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 rather than just throwing myself into a fray of a controversy or a conversation or a public discourse, actually considering for myself, well, what what do I add to that conversation? How can I actually make a difference in that conversation? And uh, and we've been given many opportunities in the last year to really see that. Um, but I also think that that pendulum swings the other way. And like Jim said, there is this kind of people are, are quick to respond and to rush into uh, opinions and judgments about things now in a way that I think it just feels a little volatile. And so for me, I've been, I've been certainly full of observation and full of contemplation and uh, wanting to make sure that I'm contributing to things in a way that I feel reflects my integrity and my authenticity but also makes things better if, if possible and where possible. And, and if it doesn't, then, you know, I, I understand that there's, there's value sometimes in just shutting up. In some of the later interviews, you can see the toll that drink and drugs take on them. Uh, Williams in particular seems to be in quite an altered state doing some of those chat show appearances. How much of that was down to the pressures of being an out gay figure at that time when it was still very much seen as taboo was it inevitable that they or was, was that more to do with just general fame because it seems to me that it seemed quite specific mm, i mean i think you know um as a sober person myself i really um i really feel like i have a relationship to um, certainly the tendency toward that behavior, but I'm living in a time where I think there are many more resources um, that I've been able to utilize to really address and look at those parts of myself that might otherwise find outlet in self-destructive ways. Um, we are encouraged in our contemporary society, I think, to more fully talk about our experiences, whether they relate to our sexual or gender identity or or just our, our the social pressures of the time i think there's there's more of an integrated sense of self examination now than there was then and i do think that truman and tennessee among some of their other contemporaries were were bearing a certain kind of burden for society where you know their sexuality was um, an unspoken but undeniable part of their personas and who they were and so i do think there comes a unique pressure with that at that time in particular but I think uh, in Tennessee's case, you can also trace his addictive uh, behavior back to traumas of his childhood, um, struggles with his relationship with his father, um, his, his sister Rose, um, who was suffering from a lot of mental illness and for whom Tennessee felt always responsible, and his mother. I mean, there, there were a lot of, um, you know, there were a lot of triggers for him that I think he wasn't really able to fully integrate or examine. But we also have this incredible body of um, profound theatrical work as a result. So there's a trade off. And, uh, and I think that that uh, that toll that you're talking about is part of the price he had to pay to leave behind him such a rich and inspiring body of work. You both recently starred in the boys in the band, which captured the lives of a group of everyday gay men at a time when we lived on the fringes of society. 
What fascinates you most about this era and why does it appeal to you to tell those stories now? Jim, would you like to go first? Sure, I would say first off that it's been like many things in my life, in my career, it's been a real blessing that they've kind of come to me. I don't know what subconsciously I'm emitting that's signaling bring me things in this area, but but I, I neither were projects that I sought out on my own. Uh, somebody else brought them, and and both, to your point, have been so rewarding. Um, you know, I think I think there's no denying that it's one can only be a product of their time. And in this case, talking about gay men specifically from an earlier era, you know, it's, 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 it's even a challenge to intellectualize about it. You have to give it thought, you have to do research, whatever, but to have the chance to take on those people to the best of your ability and walk in their shoes to the best of your ability um, does lend it a more visceral emotional quality that uh, I can't pretend to fully understand what it was to be a gay person in that era. But at the same time, I do feel that 5% more broken open in my mind about it. You know, I was saying earlier that it's, it's so non noteworthy to see two gay men in these interviews, the way we're watching in this movie right now. But, um, but it was a very different era back then. And, and I don't know what the average audience member was thinking when they were watching them, but I, I'm certain it was different than it was now. And they had less experience and less exposure to people like Truman in Tennessee. Um, it, 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 it fascinates me and it fascinates me. Zach kind of just touched on this, that being gay in that time, how that affected their work and their art and wouldn't trade the life I'm living through right now and the time I'm living through right now for the world. But I am intrigued by that idea of the degree to which they were oh, pushed into their choices by things more strongly out of their control than perhaps I'm living through right now. Their careers followed a similar trajectory. Williams was more prolific, but his professional decline began after Night of the Iguana in terms of success. And Capote struggled to complete another book after In Cold Blood. Um, and very sadly, they died just 18 months apart. Williams from drugs and Capote from alcoholism. How do you think they'll be remembered? I think they'll be remembered for their complexity, certainly. Um their undeniable skill, their talent, their insightfulness. Um, there is a tragic quality to each of them. Um, I, I feel more familiar with the journey of Tennessee and his decline was in, in many ways precipitated by a need to um, to maintain a certain level of fame and acknowledgement, celebration, maybe less fame, more celebration for his work because his earliest work was the most celebrated work and he was always dancing to keep up with that level of expectation and uh, he put a tremendous amount of pressure on himself that he was never really able to attain that uh, and, it, and it really fueled his relationship with alcohol and pills and drugs and uh you know it, it all went downhill from there so i think there is a tragic element to tennessee's journey that will always be a part of his story um and it's a part of the past from which he he was always trying you know the thing that i love about tennessee is that he was always chasing something and he was always running from something there's this duality and and in that duality i think is the greatest tragedy of uh of who he was and how will Truman be remembered, Jim? I, for me, I feel like both Truman and Tennessee will be remembered first and foremost as great writers, innovative writers, um, people who are part of our literary canon, and that and will they will always be that. Uh, it's why I enjoy working on this so much, and I think it's such a good film to watch because, you know, these lionized people they become 
in so many minds, if you don't uh, research them at all, they're they're just their names. They are their their headline is their name, and and you can read their work and get more involved. But I, this chance to peek behind the curtain to see the humanity, the tragedy that uh, of the lives that they lived. Um, it gives a more, much more complete picture of what it took, what it cost for each of them to become the great writer that we know that they are, they both are now. It's a very moving, very insightful film. And, and despite knowing a lot about them, I learned an awful lot more by watching it. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.